So welcome everybody uh, to a very special seminar. We're gonna begin now. So welcome everybody who's joining us for, uh, who's part of the regular crew that joins us for our weekly seminars, a regular seminar series. And I know other people are joining us for the first time, so welcome. My name is Charles Small. I'm the director of ISGAP, and ISGAP is the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. And today we're going to have a, a special session. It's entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Combating Racism and Antisemitism in the 21st Century. And today, uh, many of our seminars are more global in scope. This today, we're gonna focus mostly on the United States, but also, I guess, beyond. And the reason why we're having this uh, event, as many of you know, issues of racism, antisemitism, I'd say xenophobia, the reemergence of uh, nationalism is certainly an issue in the United States and in other countries around the world. Um, recent studies have shown that uh, right wing white supremacist antisemitism and racism is sort of reemerging or getting having a, some sort of comeback in the United States and in other parts of Europe and around the world. And it's very concerning. And uh, if just looking at the, you know, the recent headlines in the last couple of years, there was Charlottesville, the, the synagogue uh, being attacked in Pittsburgh, uh, the Tree of Life synagogue where many people were killed in, uh, in the synagogue, African-American churches being attacked, people being killed. Uh, the alt-right uh, re-emerging in, in places like Michigan at the footsteps of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the state senate. Um, in universities, issues of uh, racism, sexism, and certainly anti-Semitism is also affecting uh, campus life. And of course, just a couple of weeks ago, the killing, the lynching uh, that happened in February of Mr. Ahmad uh, Aubrey. Uh, became international news, and there's other uh, killings of African American, mostly men, but now also women, uh, kind of reemerging on a more regular basis, or or not reemerging, but perhaps becoming more uh, commonplace, more regular, as pathetic and horrible as that is. But I think that these sort of uh, events that have caught the headlines are systematic, or sim sorry, rather symbolic of a shifting dynamic in American society of, of the reemergence of intolerance. And uh, you know, to say that in 2021, there was a lynching in February of an innocent man jogging in the middle of the day in a middle-class neighborhood is extraordinary that uh, these words are coming out of my mouth in 2021. So today we have uh, an amazing group of uh, scholars and, and uh, people who are engaged in the in struggle for human rights and, and human dignity, fighting racism, gender inequality, and anti-Semitism. So it's an honor to be joined by Carlton Long, Suni Ali, Victoria Kamsler, Katya Gibble Mavarovich, and uh, Kevin Rome. And the first speaker today will be Carlton Long. Carlton is a, a friend of mine back from the 1980s when we studied in Oxford together. Carlton is also involved in ISGAP. He's the director of pedagogy and helps to run our summer program and other activities with us. Carlton was a, a Rose Scholar in Oxford where I met him in the 19, I won't say the number. Uh, he helped to, he helps to run our ISGAP Oxford Summer Institute. Um, he's completing his doctoral research at Morehouse College, uh, the Morehouse School of Religion and interdependent Interdenominational Theological Center, which is based in Atlanta. It's a preeminent historically black college where Martin Luther King was a, a professor. His doctoral work at Oxford focused on the Reagan-Thatcher era and um, education and multiculturalism. He's taught at Columbia University and he has many awards, distinctions, publications, and uh, an eminent uh, career in education and he helps to um, to bring young mostly African-American students and help them get uh, prestigious scholarships to go on in their in their graduate studies and he brings students to the UK and to good universities in the United States so he's doing really important work preparing the next generation of students. Uh, professor Suni Ali, uh, Suni is a professor at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. 
Um, he was on our summer institute in Oxford a couple of years ago. He's, um, he, he, pre he was uh, previously a high school teacher in social science and special ed for 20 years. He did his uh, doctorate in education, educational administration from Roosevelt University. Um, and he recently published a book on issues of hip hop and, uh, and culture. So it's an honor to have Suni with us as well. And Suni also was very much engaged in the study of anti-Semitism and racism. We have Victoria Kampsler. Victoria is an entrepreneur and an environmental ethicist who's taught at Harvard University, Wellesleyan, um, UCSC, the University of Toronto, and Princeton. And she's been a visiting uh, scholar at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University, or I should say at Princeton. And she's the founder and chair, chair of the Biochar Offset Group, an industry organization now representing more than 70 countries. And we have Katya Gibel Mirovich. Uh, Katya is an old friend and colleague, and Katya also teaches on the Summer Institute at Oxford. Uh, Katya did her BA and master's degree in African studies from uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and she's a professor of anthropology and American studies at Grinnell College. Uh, she did her PhD at Duke and Katya is the author of Black, Jewish and Interracial. It's not the color of your skin but the race of your kin and other myths of identity and she is well published and uh, internationally on issues of uh, race, anti-Semitism, gender, uh, and the sort. And we're also honored to have Car um, Kevin Rome. Kevin is the president of Fisk University, one of the preeminent uh, traditionally uh, uh, historically black colleges. It's in Nashville, Tennessee. And before he became the president of Fisk, uh, Kevin served as the 19th president of Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. He's had over 25 years of experience in higher education and served in um, many different capacities from the vice chancellor for student affairs and enrollment management at North Carolina Central University. He was the vice president for student services at Morehouse College and the vice president for campus life at Clayton State University. And he was also the assistant vice chancellor for student life and diversity at Indiana University, at Indiana University and Purdue University in Indianapolis. Um, President Rome also serves uh, on the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Educational Testing Service in, and Steering Committee and is a member of the leadership in Nashville and a member of the Rotary Club of Nashville. So it's really an honor to have uh, all of you with us and given I think the time constraints and people's capacity to focus on Zoom, we'll try to uh, limit the initial remarks to about seven minutes or so. And then at the end, when everybody has spoken, we can have Q&A and some discussion and perhaps some debate. So we're gonna start off with Carlton Long. So please, the floor is yours, Carlton. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, I thank you, say, Charles. I'm gonna interrupt you already. Okay. But, uh, I just wanna say, Carlton, thank you very much for putting this event together and to Ira Guberman who helped as well. Okay, great. Wonderful. And thank you. Thank you, Charles, for uh, the invitation and for uh, com combining us all here for this very important and timely talk. Um, I'll just mention that I, I completed my doctor of ministry two years ago at, at ITC, um, just, just by way of my, my, my background. Um, so I'm really, I'm delighted to be here. Um, lessons from Martin Luther King and Elie Wiesel. That's the way that I have framed what I like to share with everybody today. So um, I really just like to do a broad swath of a few key ideas that have resonated with me as I've contemplated uh, this topic. And then I like to leave with a few suggestions of lessons that we might carry forward in the 21st century uh, from the lives uh, that we have studied of, of King and Wiesel. So I grew up right next door to a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery in Gary, Indiana. Now this may sound like a bit of a macabre idea, but when you are raised with the idea of God and therefore to fear God and to, to seek, even as a child, to make sense of the mystery of life, 
such an odd arrangement for the block where you live is, is really not, at least it was not for me, all that peculiar or even scary. As curious children, my brothers, sisters, and I would occasionally wander into that sacred space and quietly, somberly, and rever reverently attempt to make meaning of the names and dates we found on the headstones. We would see a date, a dash, and then another date. The sunrise date, the dash, and then of course the sunset date. We were quite heartbroken and humbled sometimes, as you might imagine as children, when we did the math quickly and we realized that some of the young persons there were young children our age, some even infants, some even younger. I don't remember today any of the names that I read there so long ago, nor do I remember any of the dates representing years of life that were carved out there. In fact, I would say that most people in any, just about any given room, and I know we're all gathered here internationally from around the world, but I would, I would venture to say that most of us, no matter where we are, wherever countries we come from, most of us would probably be hard pressed to offer up by memory alone, the exact month, date and year of a person's birth and demise, particularly a person who is, say, not closely related to us. This was not altogether the case with me, at least not with the case of Martin Luther King. When my grandmother died just a year or so after Martin Luther King Jr. did, her widower, my maternal grandfather, made sure that my parents received my grandmother's voluminous beautiful, meticulously curated scrapbooks. They, they cataloged the civil rights movement in exquisite and painful American detail. Glossy, colorful images had been cut out and pasted from the covers and inside pages of things like Time Magazine and Life Magazine, Jet, Ebony. And as a little eight or nine year old, I was mesmerized by the leather bound scrapbooks. I would comb through their pages and stare at the brilliant glossy images, carefully and reverently uh, reading the written uh, words as well. A frequently visited uh, image was that of Martin Luther King Jr. And under that image were written, as you might imagine, the date of birth, a dash, and the date of his unnatural death by uh, assassination. Therefore, since childhood, I knew those dates precisely. I carried in my memory and my heart the sequence since I was a child. May 15th, um, uh, January 15th, 1929. January 15th, 1929, dash. April 4th, 1968. Anywhere I knew, January 15th, 1929, dash. April 4th, 1968. When one turns to the noble life of uh, Holocaust survivor Eli Wiesel, who, who uh, as a young teenager endured and witnessed the unspeakable evils and horrors of Auschwitz. Many and indeed most people, as in the case of Martin Luther King, simply do not know or remember the exact dates or details of the birth of, of Elie Wiesel. They may not even clock the idea that both he and, and King were born within a matter of three months of each other. But they will know of Elie Wiesel, the trilogy of books, poignant books, night, dawn, day. They will know of Wiesel's numerous other memoirs and testimonies to the wickedness, the hopelessness, and the faint but lingering hope for humankind. They know of the human rights work which Wiesel engaged in Soviet Jewry, but also the work he did for Nicaraguan Mosquito Indians, Argentinian desaparecidos, uh, Cambodian refugees, Kurds, victims of famine and genocide, in Africa and South Africans living under apartheid. In other words, for both Martin Luther King and Elie Wiesel, people may be unclear on the exact dates or, or birth of their death, but they are remarkably clear on the powerful, resilient, and redemptive qualities of their committed humanitarian lives. In other words, people all around the world can talk. Uh, they are eloquently able to talk about the dash between the bookended years. So it seems to me that there are at least two questions that can be asked today in the second decade of the 21st century. Not simply where do we go from here, the signature title of King's classic book, 
but we might also ask ourselves and our contemporaries, what are you doing with your dash? What am I doing with my dash? A symbol, but the gargantuan representation of time that we have here on earth to, to do good and to be good as best we can. King wisely asked during the height of the civil rights movement, where do we go from here? It was in that book, of course, that he gave us not only a steering account of his brave leadership in the Montgomery bus boycott, but he also talked to us about his letter from Birmingham jail, which gave us his systematic theology, reflecting leadership and a moral life. King wrote why we can't wait for an extensive period. He wrote it during a retreat in Jamaica. And biographers note that he spent time in Jamaica because he said that was one of the few places on earth where he felt most fully human, that he felt human. His, uh, his life brutally cut short. King did not even come close to climbing the mountain of our 21st century, but alone seeing his mountaintop, let alone seeing his mountaintop. Yes, yet his, his plan, Poor People's March, and his courageous public stance against the U.S. war in Vietnam, including New York uh, Riverside Church, where he gave his talk against Vietnam exactly a day, uh, a year to the uh, day of his assassination, uh, he spelled out uh, hope for a, a new future. So he gives us tools, and they are very quickly three things. The, uh, the tools, uh, lessons that we might carry into the 21st century, um, what flash might we glean from the dash in our lives? I see three major lessons. Lesson one, using discernment, being, dis, uh, being discerning. Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry? Two minutes, okay. please. And, um, you know, Sarah, Sarah Tisdale said, you know, look for a beautiful thing. It will never be far. Uh, it, it, it will not be far, it will never be far. But also I would say, I would add to that, look for evil in the world. It will sadly not be very far either. So we must recognize that that would be the first lesson that I extract from the life that I saw uh, in, in King and Elie Wiesel. And that means having concerns for Jews who are alive and not just dead Jews. This means doing the right thing by all people, not out of charity or out of a pat for a pat on the back, but out of the real politic or real politic reciprocity. It means doing the right thing from a point of personal conviction. Lesson two, as I glean it from the lives of King and Wiesel, it's very simple. Recognize evil and name it, but also be about confronting it working from a God-loving, world-loving, life-loving, love-loving, moral imperative. Recognize evil, name it, and be about confronting it. And finally, the lesson, knowing that man is wolf to man, as many philosophers have told us. As we confront evil, and as we, are be about, as we begin to be about confronting it and fighting it, we must be strategic in confronting and fighting the evil. After all, to live, to fight, for another day presupposes that you live. Both King and Wiesel possess a steely-eyed look at hate, injustice, and death. They chose love, justice, and life, and they chose them strategically. Therefore, when we look at the problems in our 21st century, and I close, a uh, world uh, in which uh, we no longer have a Martin Luther King, a world where, which is bereft of, an, of our Eli Wiesel, we still have moral blueprints and an effective grasp for strategies. So as we encounter the evils of fascism, authoritarianism, militarism, we have tools. As we witness the rise of white supremacy, hatred, sexism, xenophobia, lawlessness, we have an anchor to hold on to. When we see anti-Semitism and racism, we can remind ourselves of these basic but powerful lessons to help us move along. So in closing, I'd say, uh, I for one tend to shun the platitudinous uh, opining that is so easy for us to indulge in. That is to say, well, what would Martin Luther King uh, do if he were here? Or what would Elie Wiesel do if he were here? The simple, hard, real politic truth is that they are not here. Our dash does not fully accommodate them. Their dashes do not meet ours. They are not here. But we can curate, 
valuable lessons, moral lessons, philosophies, and even some political strategies from them. It seems to me that where we go from here is simply put greatly up to us. In our, indio, in our own idiosyncratic moment, we must carve out for ourselves and for the globe, for the future, as it is, and, and the present as it is constituted, a path of love, justice, and light to war against evil, which we have recognized, we do recognize, and to war against evil in our shared lifetime. Thank you very much, Carlton, for your, your inspiring and insightful words, and we'll come back to you during the conversation that will precede everybody else uh, speaking. So the next uh, person to speak, Professor Dr. Suni Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Smalls, Dr. Long, Isgab, for inviting me uh, to this uh, very important conversation. I think one thing that I want to take away from what Dr. Long was speaking to is about lessons being learned and how do we move forward? How do we, how do we merge the intersectionality of race and racism to help people understand that the origins of uh, racism uh, is anti-Semitism? And I want to quote from James Baldwin, because I think it's important for uh, students of color, especially in, in America and throughout the world, to understand uh, what, why it's so important to connect with anti-Semitism and, and not to see it from a, 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 a lens of, of, of difference that exists uh, between being Black, being Latinx, uh, being Asian uh, in America, but throughout the world. Uh, James Baldwin, I love this book by James Baldwin, uh, and it's really a, a, more or less an autobiography. And something he said in an article that he wrote in the late 60s, and I just want to quote what he said here. He says, and this is, this is very uh, impactful to the conversation we're having. He said, the Jew profits from his status in America, and he must expect Negroes to distrust him for it. From my analysis, from Baldwin and others, the Jews' ability to assimilate in the dominant population and succeed in America and enable them to become part of the white race in America, the race responsible for Black second-class citizenship status. So how do we counter that claim? How do we say, wait a minute, that's an archetype that's being suggested here to suggest that Jews dominate America, right? That somehow their struggle is different and, and detached from Blacks and Latinx in this country. So I, I, I really, uh, through the lens of my scholarship, I look at hip hop and how hip hop unfortunately uses a lot of the same anti-Semitic rhetoric to try to draw distinctions between the Black struggle, the Latinx struggle, and the Jewish struggle. And really, there's intersectionality. How do we bridge that to, together collectively? And again, I want to start off with saying that anti-Semitism, as the world's first racism, it has its origins in eugenics, and it has a racial stigmatization that casts Jewish people as a a, a threat on the world, right? And so there was a lot of negative perspectives toward Jewish people and it became globalized. And one way through hip hop, teaching hip hop through uh, how do we counter this anti-Semitism is that we have to first take anti-Semitism out of the American context, out of the James Baldwin context and, and allow people to see that racism or anti-Semitism is, it, we can't see it from the whiteness theoretical construct. So a lot of the whiteness theoretical construct teaches that anybody or anyone that looks white is white and Jewish people aren't white people. So we have to tease that out. We have to not only tease it out, we have to separate it out and say, look, Jewish people aren't white people. And, and that's the, really the first way to begin to counter that. So we need an intellectual paradigm shift as well. And with that, we need to better teach how racism is taught to align with anti-Semitism because at its core, racism is anti-Semitism. 
At its core, racism is anti-Semitism. So I want to kind of read um, something from text of mine that I've worked on dealing with hip hop and anti-Semitism, where I've mentioned that hip hop for some time has been a progressive movement for social and conscious change. Since its early conception, the music modified the way people positively perceive the world and identify with cultural groups. Many cultures have existed as symbiotic relatives of the genre, where African-Americans, Haitians, Latinos, white Americans, and Jews played a significant role in expanding hip hop. Moreover, Jews have existed as the managers, owners, and artists of this music genre, which has helped to enrich hip hop into a multi-billion dollar industry. So how is it possible for anti-Semitism to live in hip hop? I think one of the unique ways in the race theory class that I teach um, and about xenophobia and anti-Semitism is that you need to really, very similar to how you have a comparative religious class, we really require comparative racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobic courses. We really do because people, most students, what we, what we tend to do with history, we compartmentalize these struggles. We compartmentalize eth ethnic historical struggles and by separating them out, and we make clear distinctions, but we don't see that racism is racism, period. And, and unfortunately, through hip hop, it, it, it helps to embrace some of the Baldwin's thinking that Jewish people are white people, and therefore, there is no intersectionality with other people's liberatory struggles. Um, and then part of that, and I, I want to just read this one part here, that we have to really um, be mindful of is that there, there also exists hip hop lyrics that highlight Jewish people's ability to overcome oppression, right? So there's some artists that do a great job of connecting that intersectionality of liberatory struggle. The struggle of Jewish people to create and develop political and economic apparatuses serves as a liberating model and a blueprint for other marginalized ethnic groups to seek transformation, right? Uh, the fact that Jewish people fought to have land along with political organizations that counteracted and sell racial dogma speaks to why some hip hoppers revere Zionism as a solution matrix to counter hegemony and racial oppression. So I think what we have to do is align ourselves to more of that articulation, intellectual discovery to help bridge the struggles because oftentimes people separate these struggles out and especially in America, when I talk to students who are Jewish, they, they struggle with not seeing themselves as white. And it's because through this whiteness lens uh, paradigm that is really fostered in America, it's important to separate that and, and have them embrace the fact that you are part of this struggle and Jewish people were the first people to experience racism in the world. And so they are the pioneers of how to overcome, how to persevere. And that should be the model. And I think that's one of the ways we have to really counter anti-Semitism in this new world, to bridge our movements, to see how they intersect, and to see how they align. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Sudif. Thank you for your insightful and inspiring uh, presentation. And as you were reading the, the Baldwin quote and critiquing it, I see your poster behind you, Muhammad Ali, and I was reminded of his fight against Ernie Terrell, where he was, every time he hit him, he said, what's my name, what's my name? Because he wanted to define himself. And I think power is the ability to define who you are. And so I think your, your, your assessment with Baldwin and the picture behind you is very powerful. So thank you. And we'll, we'll open it up for discussion later. So apropos, and I think uh, given uh, Katya's work on these issues, it's wonderful to have you, Katya. And I think the timing of your contribution is perfect to, to follow Sunnis. So welcome, Katya. Thank you. Um, you know, I can improvise in front of a live audience, but this is Zoom, and so I wrote. So I'm going to do this very quickly, and hopefully you can hear and understand. And if I can make my screen sharing work, that will be fine. So I'll be honest, I'm increasingly wary of words and talking heads, or as historian Barbara Fields poetically identifies them, the scribblers and the blabbers. What more can we say about racism and anti-Semitism? 
The 20th century bleeds into the 21st century, literally and metaphorically, when black and brown bodies are killed by trigger-ready white guardians of law and order. Martin Luther King's speeches are inspiring. They're inspiring to listen to. I also listen to Malcolm X, and there's a whole list of people who I listen to when I'm down as a reminder of how to get back up. But it is much too easy to selectively appropriate ex excerpts as soothers instead of those which were reprimands. His dream about little white boys and girls walking hand in hand with little black boys and girls is proverbial. But far more imperative today, as then, are his comments on sleeping through a revolution, an allegory for complicity with the status quo. Racial, inju racial justice and economic injustice cannot be resolved without a radical redistribution of political power. And I refer to the absolute necessity of linking racism and anti-Semitism as the two sides of the same coin always connected to xenophobia. The pulpit and the classroom have to be recaptured from the bullies and the gatekeepers. And we need to get back to history. We need to get back to archives. We need to restore the power of memories. There is a reason that all the Jewish holidays register the importance of remembering, not just remembering of the other, but remembering with me, I was there. I was in place. I was brought out of Egypt. It is obligatory to remember from where we came if we are to know where we are going. And you can hear Bob Marley singing in the background. We are at an intersection. Do we dare to speak and risk being ostracized or stay silent and be popular? It is easy to intimidate and to in feel intimidated into silence. Yet we have a moral responsibility to push back against moral deterioration of our society. And since I am both Jewish and black, since I'm American and Israeli, since my Israeli citizenship, my Israeliness takes precedence for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which that I'm named for the great grandmother who was murdered in the camps in Europe. I have to say, we have to say, we are living in a terrible hour and we should be repulsed by the sight. I want to share my screen, bear with me. We should be, Ira, am I doing this correctly? Still the same right now. No. Have I shared? Oh, there it is. This sight should be repulsive. We should be repulsed by this narcissistic choreography that obliterates the pioneer generation who understood, and this includes Jabotinsky, who understood that without a democracy, the Zionist project would implode. It is impossible to ignore the fact that the new Israeli government, the coalition that was formed, was formed willfully to exclude Palestinian Israeli citizens. What happened to the moral compass? Annexation is high on the agenda right now, but has anyone noticed or spoken about how annexation channeled resources away from development towns in the Negev and in the Galil until these were finally registered as towns on the periphery? We speak of them as peripheral towns now, not as development towns. Losing the moral compass means an inability to empathize or to see the pain and humanity of others. We have become the other, and yet we remain othered, and our vision is impaired. The runway exiting the airplane at Ben Gurion Airport is lined with welcoming signs of Christians for Israel. Isn't this missionary zeal to the tune of killing me softly a form of anti Semitism? I believe we waste energy gifting media attention to insignificant politicians and local leaders with limited and ephemeral powers. Instead, we need to be focused on wolves in sheep's clothing, whose animosity against Jews as a collective, as a people, in contrast to just liking a few individual Jews, is polished and discreet. Let us not forget 
the comment that among the white supremacists, there are also some very fine people. Indeed, protesters chanting, Jews will not replace us, do not think and have never thought that white skin is a defining criteria for the existential state of being white. And this remains a shock which many American Jews and more than a few Israelis are unwilling to digest. And so I do believe that identifying and collaborating with the current Republican Senate and administration requires closing one's eyes to anti-Semitism. On the international front, criticism of, government, of Israeli government policies are too often misrecognized as anti-Semitism and ignorance rules on all sides. So permit me to be very clear. We can no longer refuse to differentiate between critics of Israel whose concern is for both Jewish Israelis and West Bank Gaza Palestinians who are not Jewish. Among those people recently smeared by the accusation of being anti-Semite, a BDS supporter, is historian Akili Mbebe. Mbebe's views are in sync with Israeli critics of the government, which you can read every day in English translation from the Hebrew Israeli press. Yes, in the academy of which I am part, we need to address the malicious, ignorant, bellicose critics of Israel without being imprisoned ourselves in their nightmare. I was witness to the rant last summer along with Charles and Carlton and a few others to the violent, hate-filled people whose verbal animosity and smugness rivaled the less violent members of the white supremacists that we've seen on TV. These were people with PhDs and their graduate students in whom hate has been cultivated for Israel. Faculty whose academic credentials should be invalidated yet tenure licenses them to preach lies without even the pretense of teaching the scholarly significance of maximizing objectivity and transparency, both of which are an imperative for critical thinking as well as strategic advocacy. Advocates of the boycott, divestment, and, san and sanctions movement show contempt for Israel, but also reveal considerable disdain for Palestinians and Arab countries in the region. Their worn cliches against Eurocentrism and neocolonialism display an obsessive addiction which fetishizes the West. Intentional non-learning best describes profound ignorance of the long histories of Jews and Muslims and the Eastern origins of the Jewish people whose language before dispersion throughout the diaspora was ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, not Yiddish, not English, not German, not French. And we might have time later to talk about the current fascination with Ashkenazi Haredim, which misrepresents Jews in the global diversity by leaving out so many other versions of Jewish practice. History is always inconvenient, even in its best postmodern versions. But the internet has become a pawn for those who erase through stubborn omission an important fact. Our Jewish ancestors are inevitably and permanently tied to the land of Israel and also to the destiny of Arab Muslims through Abraham the patriarch and his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. These two sons were reunited for a moment when they buried their father, estranged, and yet their, des their descendants are cousins for whom the cave of the patriarch in Hebron retains significance. I'm almost done. The ideological extremists forget history. And if we all suffer, we do not all suffer equally. Two more sentences, long sentences. We should not banalize anti-Semitism by invoking the accusation irresponsibly. With only a few months before the elections in the United States, we should be less concerned with the messenger and heed the message which complements the Jewish prophetic tradition of tikkun olam, to repair the world. Yes, I don't like him, but Bernie Sanders is correct. It is not anti-Semitism to say that the Netanyahu government has acted with racism. We Jews have an ongoing responsibility to side with justice and freedom. We have to stay the path and remember 
especially with Shavuot just a few days away, that our uniqueness is our strength and the call to push back against anti-Semitism as racism is a mandate to refuse to sleep through the radical revolution negatively transforming the world around us today. And just as other examples, this quick picture of Martin Luther King and Rabbi Heschel for the American context should remain something that our young students, as Dr. Sunni Ali, should know about and should revisit. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. A lot of food for thought. Thank you for your analysis. And I'm sure we'll pick up some of the, the issues you raised in the Q&A. So next up is Victoria. Victoria, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you, good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Congratulations to Dr. Small for the success of this new online program. And um, so back in the day when I was a grad student at Oxford, I had the opportunity to work on the South Africa sanctions legislation in um, Senator Ted Kennedy's foreign policy office. So for me, it's a special honor to come and have a chance to discuss these very deep and important topics with this distinguished panel. I'm also grateful to Katya for mentioning the concept of tikkun olam, the imperative to heal the world in the Jewish ethical tradition. And I think I would frame my comments about, that I'm about to make about structural inequality in the context of tikkun olam. Martin Luther King said, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. The profound and still emerging crisis that is COVID-19 has revealed the depths of structural inequality in the United States and its racist heritage. Structural inequality denies safe and equitable working conditions for the professions we most rely upon for our fundamental needs, which are disproportionately staffed by people of color. Structural inequality concentrates African Americans in prison systems where they are now in lethal danger in some of the worst hotspots of the pandemic. Structural inequality underlies the blistering disparities in public health, sorting out people's life chances by their race and by their zip code. These inequalities have now come to the surface in plain view for everyone to see. They are impossible to ignore. This great crisis of our time demands an equally great effort of understanding, of courage, and of action. In this talk, I'd like to propose that some of the great emergencies of our time are interconnected. The future of racism and anti-Semitism is bound up with other great challenges, namely environmental destruction and the climate crisis. They are heightened by and reverberate through positive feedback systems. And though we often talk about each separately, it is more unusual to consider them together. So today, I'll discuss structural inequality, racism and anti-Semitism, and their interconnections with the other great contemporary crises, disfoliation of the environment and the climate crisis. I will discuss first the overwhelming revelation of the depths of racism and its effects that are made plain by the pandemic. And second, how the pandemic and the climate crisis may prime the pump of anti-Semitism in ways that history has prepared us to expect. Analytically, this calls for a systems approach to see the connections between issues that are typically considered separately by separate pools of experts. Morally, it calls us to recognize the links between environmental justice, environmental ethics, and racial justice and equality. Begin with health inequality. King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. We now know the appalling disproportionate toll the coronavirus has taken on communities of color and African-Americans in particular. In COVID-19, racism is a pre-existing condition. While never forgetting the great danger that our parents and grandparents are facing in assisted living facilities, which is another and even worse pandemic scenario, our topic today leads us to the prism of race as a way to understand what is going on around us. So, racial disparity. Let's look at the numbers. In late April, 
Johns Hopkins University published an online map showing the states that have broken down their COVID-19 statistics by race. That map is incomplete and I'm gonna cherry pick in the interests of time. In Chicago, African-Americans account for more than half of those who have tested positive and 72% of virus-related fatalities, even though they are less than one third of the population. In Illinois as a whole, where African-Americans are 15% of the population, they account for 24% tested positive and 38% of those who have died. And I'll just skip to one last example in Louisiana, where African-Americans are about one third of the population, they account for 70% of all the deaths from coronavirus. What has happened here? To members of this audience, it won't be surprising. Black Americans disproportionately belong to the part of the workforce that can't work from home, that have pre-existing medical conditions, that don't have insurance, that face racial bias in medical treatment. Government redlining policies of the 1930s have left a legacy of segregated neighborhoods with higher stresses, lower life expectancy, food deserts with little access to healthy food, and compromised immune systems. I spoke about feedback loops. This give, gives rise to two positive feedback loops. First positive feedback loop, where the virus hits, it deepens the effect of racial inequality. And inequality and poverty are in turn known to increase rates of infection and epidemics. Second positive feedback loop, as the toll of the virus increases, it deepens the socioeconomic divides that drive right-wing populism, racial animosity, and anti-Semitism. This is also true of the socioeconomic effects of climate change. So that's a brief account of some structural factors that show how the virus plays into the history and future of racism and anti-Semitism. But what about the virus itself? What are the forces that have thrown the world into this cauldron, bringing the cultural sources of racism and anti-Semitism to a new boiling point. Here, we must understand the sources of global pandemics, and these sources are found in the despoliation of the natural world. When we talk about structural inequality, race and the environment, we usually talk about environmental justice. That is the statistical fact that people who live and work in the most polluted environments are commonly people of color and that these communities are targeted to host the most environmentally dangerous projects and facilities. But now in the time of the pandemic, we must also talk about race and environmental ethics, meaning how to comport ourselves in relation to the biosphere and the natural world. Why? Because the biosphere is biting back in ways that exacerbate the social and economic factors that heighten racial inequality and anti-Semitism. According to the CDC, Three quarters of new or emerging diseases that infect humans originate in animals. Deforestation and other forms of land conversion push animals out of their habitats and into man-made environments where they breed new strains of disease. There is a, now a broad scientific consensus that increasing habitat destruction is leading to the spread of zoonotic diseases and is an essential condition of the proliferation of new viruses a very short list of some of the important zoonotic uh, diseases that we've encountered. SARS shares 80% of its genome with civet cats. MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome came from camels. Ebola came from bats. Bird flu from chickens, H1N1 from pigs and so forth. So apart from wildlife vectors, zoonotic diseases have a long history of being transmitted from domesticated animals to humans. Um, modern factory farms with crowded conditions and overuse of antibiotics create new dangers for the spread of disease and antibiotic resistant bacteria. So why bring all of this into a discussion on racism and anti-Semitism? Two reasons. We are now painfully aware of the social and economic devastation that these diseases can bring. They exacerbate existing injustices and create the social and economic conditions in which racist, 
and anti-Semitic scapegoating have historically flourished. As the Holocaust scholar Deborah Lipstadt has often observed, anti-Semitism is like a virus that is always present in the body of society. At times of pressure, there will be outbreaks and virulent hatreds can be unleashed. We might also, uh, in an adjacent matter, note that the state of Israel may now also be faced with a flood of climate refugees as its more secure water supply from advanced desalination system becomes a magnet for people fleeing the water crisis and hydrogeological problems in neighboring countries. A second reason to talk about the, the natural environment in the context of racism and anti-Semitism is that the legacy of Dr. King encourages us to broaden our ethical horizons, to expand the contours of our moral concepts. Now it is time to think about the impact of our societies on the natural world around us and its creatures. So here is something new for the future of racism and anti-Semitism. For both structural and moral reasons, opponents of racism and anti-Semitism should give thought to our place in the natural world and its effect on our communities. Analytically, a systems perspective will show the complex web of connections that both foster and exacerbate underlying racist and anti-Semitic forces. Ethically, we are called to extend the boundaries of our concepts of justice and ethics to include other sentient beings and the biosphere as a whole. Martin Luther King gets the last word. Never ever be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Really insightful and uh, even profound. Thank you for your contribution. Um, next up is uh, President Kevin Rome. The floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with the slide and then I will start the presentation. And I want to uh, thank my colleagues for uh, great presentations prior to this. Okay. Danny Ray Thomas, Steve, Stephon Clark, Johnny Jermaine Rush, Richard Herbert, Demetrius Bryan, Dewan Hall, Terrence Crutcher, Paul O'Neill, Joseph Mann, Orlando Castle, Ahmad Aubrey. What factors what systemic factors do each of these members of the black community have in common? Just think about it. When we look at the African American community, and I come from the perspective of one who works at a university. And I deal with students from various social economic backgrounds. When you think about the violence that have been afflicted upon everyone on the screen now, they were all killed. They were unarmed and killed for being black. We know throughout history that African Americans and Jewish people have been killed for being who they are not for what they've done, but simply for being themselves. But when we think about the violence that's happened, the violence just doesn't happen to us physically. If we look at the economic violence that happens to our communities, if we look at job opportunities, if we look at business opportunities for African-Americans, if we look at all of the factors that lead to 
us rising in our economic positions in this country, they're all under attack violently. When we look at educational opportunities for people of color in this country, when we think about the opportunities in urban education, when we think about school systems, when we think about private education, there's violence in the educational system attacking those who are the most vulnerable and the most needy. When we look at housing opportunities in this country, and if you look at the Jewish community historically, and you look at the African American community, there were not opportunities to own homes. And if you look at the African American community today, when we look at mortgage rates, when we look at communities, when we look at opportunities, home ownership still pales in comparison to other groups. When we think about the psychological experiences of African Americans and Jewish people, in our country, in the US, it was based on the foundation that Europeans are better than those who are not. There's an otherism. And so anyone who is in the other category would be considered less than the standard. So every group has to measure up to the standard. But the reality is the way the system is created, there's no group that can stand up to the standard that has been set in this country. And so the psychological warfare and the violence against the groups, and someone mentioned it earlier, they can't be other than who and what they are. And so if, you, if we send the messages to them that what they are is less than ideal, less than being the best, less than whatever categories you use or consider, is psychological violence. And as we just heard about the health violence that happens in this country to people of color and poor people, historically it's been a problem, but it's really shown its face with COVID-19. But that's not new to people who have been aware of the health violence that has occurred in this country with insurance, with appropriate health care, with access to doctors and preventative health care. That is health violence to these groups. So when we think about and look at racism and anti-Semitism, they're really violence that's inflicted upon groups simply based on their identity. And so if we talk to leaders from the past, our current leaders, we have some challenges. So we ask, where do we go from here? We have to end the systems that create the violence. We have to reprogram the minds of those who have been inflicted by the systems, the systematic violence that occurs in this country. So I know that my colleagues have mentioned many things and I didn't want to, and I don't want to repeat things that they've said, but as we move forward, it's imperative that we look at systems that inflict violence upon people on various levels. And at the end of the day, it's all violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin, President Rome, for your for your wisdom and insights, and really thank you, thank everybody very much for your uh, contributions. Really powerful uh, presentations. So I'm going to give a very brief presentation, and then I'll, I'll open it up for questions and discussion. And I was going to speak about the reemergence of uh, anti-Semitism and racism, and in terms of the history of racism and anti-Semitism. And listening to you, I was thinking of the words of and the teachings of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and his notion of, of uh, double consciousness. And du, Bo du Bois 
was also, I think, instrumental in understanding not only race and racism in the United States, but he was also a scholar in Berlin. And while he was in Berlin, he was a fair-skinned person of African origin, and he was he was often mistaken as Jewish. And he, he wrote about, about being mistaken as Jewish. And I have to interject, he's a Fisk graduate, so yeah, I, I, I want everyone to know that. I know, I know. And uh, yeah, so very, very important, very profound thinker. And I think his notion of double consciousness is important for a lot of the themes that uh, you all uh, dealt with in your presentation. I'm also th thinking of the words of Franz Fanon when he was in Paris and he was telling his African colleagues who were in France listening to European intellectuals insult Jews. And when Fanon told his African compatriots that when the anti-Semites, the European anti-Semites tell you about the Jews, know that when, they, when you leave the room, they're going to be speaking about Africans as well. So there's, the screen has been, uh, okay. Sorry. You put, okay, Katya, you put up the, the thing. Thank you. I'm also thought, thinking of the words and the teachings of Ami Césaire and his book on discourse on colonialism, where he looks at the brutality of colonialism and racism and how the European colonial experience comes out of Europe and comes out of a history of anti-Semitism, which culminates in the Holocaust. So there's a, there's a foundational connection between understanding racism and anti-Semitism in African and African-American literature that I think needs to be uh, explored given the contemporary challenges that we face. Um, in terms of the United States, the sort of the reemergence of anti-Semitism, I think there's three forms of anti-Semitism. There's the radical left, there's the radical right, the sort of the racist, racist nationalists, and political Islam. And it's these three extreme manifestations of anti-Semitism, which I think is an early warning to perhaps the excesses of marginality and neoliberal globalization and the marginalization that is we're experiencing in the United States and in other parts of the world. And it's these cleavages, I think, which are exacerbating um, the rise of these reactionary social movements. Um, and I, I think, in a sense, the rise of right-wing nationalism and xenophobia and racism is alarming. And I think the right has a tendency in some of the works of Boaz Ganor, the ADL, show that the right-wing extremists are often more violent or more physically violent and potentially uh, violent as they are uh, in many instances in the United States armed and dangerous. And we saw this in Michigan on several occasions recently and in Charlottesville and other parts of the country. Um, and the thing that concerns me too is the rise of radical, the radical so-called left uh, in the United States. And that's more in the sort of liberal institutions of the media of record and of universities. And we have this sort of red green alliance where philosophically people in the sort of the decolonial uh, literature and the postmodern literature, the, the Edward Said, the Judith Butlers that demonize who Jews are as a people. So I'd say there's three types of anti-Semitisms. There's a religious form of anti-Semitism, a racist form of anti-Semitism, and now the contemporary attack on who Jews are as a people. So in the old days, when the dominant perspective of perceiving reality was through the lens of religion, the Jews were the wrong religion. And according to the European Christian teachings and beyond Europe at various points in times, the Jew the Jew who did not accept the Christian notion of the Messiah could not have redemption, spiritual redemption. But what makes anti-Semitism genocidal, and I'm choosing my words carefully, is the fact that the Jew has to be changed and civilized to save the world. So Christian teaching, the church taught that not only would the Jew not receive redemption, but that by not accepting the gospels and the Christian notion of the Messiah, they were hindering world redemption. So the fact that there was not world redemption was the fault of the Jew. When the dominant perspective shifted from religion to race and nationality or nationalism and ethnicity, sort of biologically determined notions of identity, the Jew 
living in different parts of the world in different societies for generations, for many generations and, and centuries, were perceived as different and the outsider and belonging to an inferior race. And what made the Jewish race so dangerous was that they were uh, posing a threat to the purity of the white Aryan race. So unlike during the times of religion, when the Jew had the, uh, an exit, they could convert to save their life. When things were bi bio, sort of biologically determined, there was no escaping your racial identity because philosophy and social sciences and theology taught that there was no escaping race. Once you were defined in a certain biological group, there's, you were in, innately, it was an innate characteristic of your being. There's no escape. So this type of racist anti-Semitism culminates in the Holocaust and the extermination of the Jewish people of Europe and North Africa and, and beyond. Today, those forms of anti-Semitism are uh, in most circles and networks problematic, although they're re-emerging as we, we know. But today the, the type of anti-Semitism which is practiced, the demonization which is practiced is an attack on who Jews are as a people. Jewish notions of Jewish peoplehood. So the demonization of Israel. Israel is an apartheid, racist, fascist state. Uh, and Jews who have a strong identity and a strong personal, cultural, religious connection to the land of Israel. And if they're living in the diaspora, and I'd say particularly in the diaspora in progressive liberal circles like universities, so Jewish students and faculty with a strong connection to their religion, their culture, their history and heritage become problematic because the, the most horrific epithet you can accuse somebody or demonize somebody is that they are in a liberal space, racist, colonialist, apartheid supporting, fascists, pink washers, etc. So the demonization of Israel is also connected and, and, and Jewish people, it is connected to uh, contemporary anti-Semitism. And there's been studies being done on campuses in the United States and in Europe. Jewish students are particularly uh, targeted for uh, discrimination and harassment. Uh, Barry Cosman did a study on American students in the United States looking at issues of racism, sexism, and anti-Semitism. And the Jewish students experiencing anti-Semitism was two to three times higher than women on American campuses experiencing or witnessing sexism and people, African-American students experiencing or witnessing racist acts. So there is a, a culture, an environment in these sort of liberal spaces that are problematic. And I would say people, uh, the, the removal of women from the women's movement, Linda Sassor and Mallory and other people saying that Zionist women don't uh, qualify for, for being part of the uh, women's movement, the sort of the, the marginalization of Jewish women and Jewish students in the intellectual space is extraordinarily, uh, I would argue, problematic. And I think going back to Mebeni from, who's in South Africa, he's actually from Cameroon to respond to what Katja was saying, um, to label, to support the BDS movement and to label Israel as an apartheid state is I think historically just, it's just, incorrect and uh, it's problematic. And I'm saying this not just as a, a person concerned about the Jewish community of the state of Israel, which I am. I'm also somebody who studies these issues and was very active in the anti-apartheid movement. I was the chairperson of the African National Congress Solidarity Committee of Canada and the United Kingdom and worked with the leadership of the ANC and was in South Africa in the 80s and 90s on the ground in, squ in squatter camps and in townships fighting a apartheid. And I fought apartheid in part, like Katya, because my grandparents migrated as refugees uh, to Canada, escaping Nazism and racism, which the ideology of Nazism and racism was very much alive and well in apartheid South Africa when we were sort of coming of age, which I remember a professor telling me about apartheid South Africa. For, I learned about it for the first time at McGill University. And I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that in my lifetime, this system was not only existing, but at the time entrenched uh, in power. So to label Israel as an apartheid state is to delegitimize it. And of course, the Jews and the Israelis are not conquering people and converting them 
changing their language, etc. And so we'll just the demonization of Israel is the gateway to contemporary anti-Semitism. Now, we have to also say, and I think Sunni touches on it in his work, that the, the anti-Semitism in the African-American community and the racism in the Jewish community needs to be, I think, unpacked and dealt with. And I'm, I'm thinking now, of course, of the Nation of Islam and their engagement in engaging artists in the African-American community who are very important in the community for sharing wisdom and knowledge, history, but also contemporary ideas. And the anti-Semitism that is being peddled by the Nation of Islam and, and trying to influence journalists and musicians and artists is extraordinarily problematic. The movement of, um, from Ferguson to Gaza, the hijacking of a very important movement of Black Lives Matter, speaking on behalf of a, of a diverse, important movement um, and, and demonizing the Jewish people, demonizing Israel. Mems going around that the Israeli government is training uh, police officers in the United States to, to train police officers to kill African-American men. They're trained in Israel, they return to the United States to kill African-American men. This type of vulgar um, anti-Semitism needs to be addressed and, and the racism in our communities also need to be addressed to forge, I think urgently, um, a deeper understanding of racism and processes of racism and a deeper understanding of contemporary anti-Semitism and the processes uh, surrounding it to build an effective coalition, an effective movement to confront contemporary racism and anti-Semitism. And I, and I think as, as Victoria outlined, given COVID-19 and pandemics and the perception of Jews and African-Americans, of ghettos, of contaminated populations, that these types of discourses which strengthen, as Victoria was saying, right-wing racist uh, movements is extraordinarily problematic and rooted deep in history and deep in the social 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 sciences and ideology of our of our society so these are in a sense i think warning systems to society that are the basic notions of equality of citizenship is um has been under threat for many years for many generations but i think it's rise the threat to basic notions of human rights and human dignity citizenship equality is under threat, and I think the rise of racism and anti-Semitism is almost like an early warning system, or a, maybe not an early warning system, but a warning system to the threat, not only to our communities, the African-American and Jewish communities in the United States and beyond, but to basic notions of human rights and democracy. So this is something that I think that scholars of goodwill and policymakers of goodwill really need to rethink a lot of our assumptions and I think a lot of our assumptions about race and anti-Semitism and about democracy. And I'll just end on this note. I remember for many years, American Jewish leaders, American scholars would point to anti-Semitism in Europe and other parts of the world in the Middle East, but we're under this sort of false assumption that it could never happen here in the United States, that somehow the United States was an island of um, safety. But we see that the sort of the, the marginalization in societies is being exacerbated to the point where I think uh, many assumptions, many of our assumptions are, that are, are being challenged by the, uh, the emerging realities and it calls for a, a response, an assessment and a response by intellectuals, by scholars, by student activists and policy makers. So on that note, I'll end it there. And I think everybody could unmute their mics and I'm gonna start uh, with the prerog pre I'll take the pre uh, prerogative of beginning to answer, to ask you some questions that are being sent in by people. The people listening to us, you're very welcome to send questions and I'll pose it to the panel. So there's a question by Bobby Meth and he, he asked the panel, racism as a term is frequently overused inappropriately. Would the panelists agree that with, with that makes it that what makes it so um, 
egregiously evil and what is unique in the term in, in uniquely in common with Jew hatred or anti-Semitism is that racism and anti-Semitism are two forms of bigotry where the victim is being discriminated against similarly based on what they are both born into. So who would like to respond to that? Well, um, I would just say that, you know, it, it seems like the, the questioner is asking about essentialism and it seems to me like many forms of hatred are premised upon something uh, essentialistic. There's this notion that you are this and therefore um, you lack value. So while I, I, I see the connection in terms of saying um, there is that premise for uh, looking at anti-Semitism and racism. When we look at some of the other isms, they are also essentialist as well. So I'll just ask the questioner to consider that in the scope. Cool. Thank you, Carlton. Another question is um, from Holly Hamby, and she asked Dr. Rome, as well as the other panelists, she says that at Fisk, we created a social justice institute uh, th just this academic year a revision of our historic race relations institute. How can scholars and, and the university community use these university centers and programs to direct uh, boots on the ground to fight both racism and anti-Semitism? Well, I think it's, thank you for the question. I, I think it's imperative that we instill in young people as early as possible, their responsibility to address these issues. It's not a task, it's not, it's a responsibility of everyone to take on these, the, the, these responsibilities. And, and, and as the, the, the prior question, racism and xenophobia, and, 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 and you, you think of, are so inherent in the culture of our country that we don't even realize it when it's happening. Many of the times, and those who are exhibiting may not even be aware of their behavior, and so, we have to bring that to the light and bring it to, 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 the, uh, to the surface so people understand when it's happening, how it happens, and the impact. And I think those centers can be imperative in allowing that to happen in an educational environment, in a strategic environment, and not in a blaming environment. Thank you. So um, I, go ahead. I would say that you know, from ISGAP, I created my syllabus. So the center could be one place where you bring together various syllabi that can help influence the kind of courses and structure of material that are integrated into syllabi. But I would just add to that two photos, if I may, um, if I can do this again, I'm not sure that I can, um, from my, uh, you know, it's very important to go back to history because people don't know history. Right? It's very easy to forget that not very long ago, in terms of time, American history, as far as Europe is concerned, is like modern. And as far as Africa and Asia are concerned, the, the United States is still an embryo. But this image here was a rampant image. It's from Harper's Magazine. It took a lot of work to take this Irishman off of the pedestal with Black people. Or for so many American Jews in particular, to forget the depictions of how Jews became white. I mean, this is something which is unknown just by not knowing history. So I think that the significance of going back into the archives, pulling out the timeline of how changes took place as a consequence of laws and policies and social behavior and social norms is incredibly important for understanding where we are at this moment. I would remind um, us all that James Baldwin did not speak out of a context. And perhaps the most important quote that is relevant for today is the way in which the Negro, he says here at the bottom, is it singled out not because he acts differently from other white men, but because he doesn't. And this buying into American white Christianity for the privilege and the benefits of being considered white. That is exactly one of the problems that Jews in the United States face and 
I, one example is an easy one. I mean, I don't, I, you know, Charles, I, I've never agreed with the fact that we have to waste our energy on people who are not important. Linda Sassour is not important. I'm sorry. She's a big deal in New York City. I'm in Grinnell, Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. Her name is barely known. But what is for certain is that Palestinians who are blonde, Syrians who are blonde, call themselves people of color. But how many Jews call themselves people of color rather than taking it literally as literally color? Well, we all have color. I mean, the way that we speak, we have to be, we have to do what John Singleton um, spoke about in one of his films. We have to unlearn. And our task as educators is to help students unlearn. Thanks, Katya. So it's interesting. I'll say two things very quickly. And I think this is interesting to, to the American, the US context. So first of all, I'd say Linda Sarsour is important. Um, she's a special advisor to Bernie Sanders on the Middle East. She's a, a leading feminist uh, figure. She's also very active with Students for Justice in Palestine on American university campuses in the BDS movement, which is global, which you, you quoted one of its uh, disciples from, who's now based in South Africa. And this, we do, on our website, if anybody want, is interested, if you go to www.isgap.org, there's a report that we did on Students for Justice in Palestine. And in terms of racism in the United States, I think this is profoundly important. It's profoundly important. So you have Students for Justice in Palestine who've made inroads in with the Coalition with Black Lives Matter, with the Nation of Islam and other liberal actors. The Students for Justice in Palestine are born out of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood literally, literally, owes its intellectual heritage not only to the most reactionary forces in Europe and bringing anti-Semitism, which is a genocidal form of hatred, which was European, to the Middle East, to Egypt, and then beyond, but they literally owe their intellectual heritage, and I'm choosing my words very carefully, to Nazism, to Nazism. So now you have progressive people connected to Bernie Sanders who fights for healthcare. I grew up in Canada where healthcare is still a human right and uh, education is as, as well, um, which I think is an important, very important issue if we care about democracy and social democracy and equality. But for, for this type of um, movements to exist on campus in the, and have kind of a progressive coalition surrounding it, uh, and, and furthers an anti-Semitism which is rooted in Nazism, which is part of a liberal uh, discourse and rhetoric, not only on campuses, but in the classrooms of our finest universities. That the type of anti-Semitism that exists now in the United States of America on campuses, in classrooms, is to me deeply, deeply alarming and should be alarming for everybody who cares about human rights and democracy. So these are, to me, very important issues. And it's happening right under our noses, a coalition that's being born. So um, there's many questions I want to bring in. There's several questions. Nobody, none of us spoke about um, Ilan Omar and Rashid Tal Talib, which I think points to some of the sort of coalitions that uh, the sort of progressive coalition with Islamism. Uh, does anybody want to comment on, on this type of... Uh, you know, now it's in our Congress. What do people think about that? Does anybody want to comment on that issue? So several people have asked about that. Well, again, I just think I want to reiterate the fact that we can give power. We give power when we give voice to the very people that nobody else is really paying attention to. Donald Trump would not have been elected if CNN had not been obsessed with nonstop talking about him. He had free press. Every time we talk about politicians who have local, we don't even know how much local credibility there is because they deal with other issues with their constituents, but there is a way in which we overinflate the power, the influence of people who are not important. And I am on an American campus in the middle of the cornfields. And Des Moines is a very important, I suggest you all move to Des Moines. It's a growing small town. But the reality is, what happens on the East Coast, what happens on the West Coast is precisely part of the problem of overlooking what happens in the middle of the country. And it's a big middle of the country. And I just want to add one thing to that. We spend a lot of media time 
in urban areas. But outside of urban areas, there are rural areas, there are small towns, there are white and black and Latino and immigrants. The Tyson Meat Production Factory had some 86 different ethnic, ethnic I'm using in terms of national origin groups. It is not simply a matter of 1950s segregation and Jim Crow racism, but there is economic injustice. And if we spent more time talking about economic injustice and spent more time focusing on people who are decision makers, who really wield power because they have money behind them, it would be of more benefit. Bernie Sanders could not even be bothered to go down to Mississippi. But you know what? South Carolina's James Clyburn spent a half an hour endorsing Biden. We don't have to like or dislike Biden. But what we do know is that Bernie Sanders was important. He was given importance, but he wasn't really that important at the end of the day. He's a blip on the scene. So why give him the extra time? As for Elon Omar, okay, she's there. She's pretty, she's attractive, she's media hype. So were some people um, like Winnie Mandela, but there were far more important black women in South Africa at the forefront of the anti-apartheid movement inside South Africa. Americans loved Winnie Mandela because she was pretty and she was public. Nelson Mandela came out of jail. He didn't love her so much. Uh, thank you, Katya. So, Katya, some uh, James uh, Vegan just wrote. Uh, thank he thanks his guest for holding the forum, and he was struck by your comments, Katya, quoting Martin Luther King's uh, warning not to sleep through a revolution. So he would like to plug uh, to this audience that Reverend William Barber's one one one's virtual march in Washington is coming up in June, and I think it's he thinks it's June the twentieth, but I think double check Google it. And he's interested maybe that we would form some sort of partnership with uh, ISGAP and to participate in this movement. So Mr. James Vegan, I'd be interested to speak with you offline and learn more about this. So thank you. Um, does anybody else have any comments on well, the panel? You know, Charles, um, there's, there's one um, question that I'm seeing up here that kind of seems to connect to what a lot of us have been saying. Um, Austin Scott, I'm looking at the second part of this question is what has to be done uh, to restore the social, political and economic relationship between African Americans and Jewish people. And um, I, it kind of, in some ways, paraphrases this idea of like what, what, um, what must be done or where do we go from here? I'm looking at this with relationship to the HBCU. We have Fisk here. We've partnered uh, SUNY. We've had conversations in ISCAP with HBCUs. Um, we have uh, uh, folks here who have been affiliated with Israeli universities. And so I, I guess and on a point of hope, is there any hope for a uh, combination between HBCUs and Israeli universities? Uh, Charles, I know you and I spoke years ago about getting young African American black students uh, with uh, uh, Jewish students together to understand so many of the commonalities in order to forge um, a better partnership and to move beyond some of the brokenness uh, that you've alluded to. So I, I think uh, Austin Scott's um, comment here might help us. So I just want to throw that out to everybody and see to maybe if we can land on a point of hope and partnership. So Carl, just very briefly, I'll turn it over to everybody. Carlton, thanks for raising the question. And Austin Scott, thank you. And yeah, I couldn't agree more with the sentiment of the question. And Carlton, your point, I think that there's a real need, an urgent need for those of us concerned about racism and anti-Semitism and developing coalitions to fight for social democracy and economic justice uh, to come together and learn together, study together and develop deeper understanding. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's essential. Just one correction, and it would be useful for us as a beginning, is to, not, is to be careful how we phrase words because how we phrase sentences reinforces patterns of thought. To say Jews and Blacks is to assume that there are Black people and then there are Jews, Jews and Asians. <coughs> but there are Arabs who are Jews and there are Arabs who are Muslims and there are Arabs who are Christians. So we, I just want to remind us that there are Jew, Jews come in all colors of all backgrounds, of all kinds of practices and from the very far left to the very far extreme right. And how we speak, it's, I think of it often with the term African-American, 
We're a whole generation of young children who are immigrants of Africans whose parents came to graduate school, to medical school. They are Americans of African descent. And those who can trace themselves back to the West Indies or to the slave ships 300, 400 years ago come in all kinds of colors. So it gets complex, but our responsibility as academics is to seek that precision and to help change the way that we speak. And one last thing, I posted on the chat an interview, a recent interview with Mbebe, and I recommend that people read what he said and not excerpts and interpretations of what he said. Thank you, Katja. So we will agree to disagree on Mbebe and the BDS movement, which uh, our ongoing conversation for the last four years has been fruitful. So thank you. And I'd also add, I agree with what you said in terms of identities and categories. And also something that's really fascinating to me and some of our, my colleagues is looking at the Jewish, uh, I'd say, civilization in Africa. And there's a reawakening in, throughout Africa, literally throughout Africa, of the of the sort of ancient and contemporary Jewish identities. Um, there was a study in Angola recently where people were asked an open-ended question what their religion was. 20%, 20% said Jewish. So extraordinary. There's a, we're living in extraordinary times. So, yeah. Suni, would you like to chime in, or Victoria? Yeah, I would. I would say too. It's very critical. I know, Doctor Small, in your in your lecture, you were talking about biological determinism, and I think that's important to recognize that when you are put in a category, you are the other. So, I think we have to do a better job of linking our struggles and not seeing them separate. And you know, Jewish people are not white people. Jewish people are people of color. Right. And I think it's important to have that distinction and say that they have the very same struggles that, um, you know, other people have uh, throughout the world. But especially in the states here, uh, there's this disconnect, you know, African-American, Latinx, and in many ways, our Jewish brothers and sisters are seen as white, you know, and so and some of them have bought into the whiteness theory. And I think it's very incumbent upon us to bridge the, the history, as, which has been so illustrated beautifully, and, and really authenticate how the origins of the Jewish struggle is the origins of racism that we see in the modern world. And I think our courses, our articulation, our, our work with youth have to constantly push, push that forward. Thank you. Really, I, I would just, if I could add that there's a great need for more focus on science, right? That um, there's, an, uh, there's so much of a sense that um, race is inherently real. And so it's very useful for us if we can begin to unpack the whole notion of racing, uh, being race as a, a certain identity. I know that uh, Katya has, has spoken of this and, and Barbara Fields has written about this sort of thing and so have many others. Um, we, we're in the whole world of haplogroup science. There's a lot of kind of uh, demystification of, of group identity based on, on, um, on our, um, our haplogroup uh, background. So this is all very, very delicate because then we move into, uh, you know, one of the problems in history has been the way that um, biology has been used against uh, uh, those who are um, raced as black or as Jewish. Um, and and uh, you have phrenology and all these old, old problems. Um, so it, it, some people don't even want to look at haplogroup science because you're getting back into the area of talking about genes. So it's just very interesting if we can begin to unpack and see the granularity and the reification of race, the kinds of things that Omi and Wynette talk about uh, and, and many others. So I agree, but we know it's also interesting, Carlton. I, I think your points are right on and very important. But at the same time, I'm thinking of those characters watch, walk, walk, marching on the uh, Senate of Michigan or the rhetoric of Charlottesville. They don't really care about these distinctions that much. But uh, no. Well, they don't know them. They haven't a clue. They don't, know them from, they don't know them from their elbows. That's part of the problem. They learned something somewhere. Yeah. 
I, I would like group. to really just pick up where you left uh, Dr. Long too. I mean, look at what's happening with our Chinese American brothers and sisters. They're catching, you know, hell in this country being attacked racially uh, because we have uh, the leader of the free world calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, and, and the origins of the, the Chinese uh, Americans coming to this country and building the railroads and the stigmatization of them uh, spreading diseases now, that's, you know, full circle 100 years later. And, you know, here we are. And so that, again, when you're putting that categorization of the other, you have to, you, you know, it's hard to break out of that construct, no matter how much you assimilate, no, ma no matter how much you accept it as being white or on team white, or, you know, how silent you are. So when other groups are being attacked, you're silent until it hits you, you know, and isn't there a, a great um, uh, Jewish um, statement during the Holocaust that they first came for the Catholics and I was silent and they came, you know, on and on and then they find and then they came for me and there was nobody left to speak for me. So I think we have to be speaking for each other and unifying and, and, and understanding the importance of uh, coming together to push back against this racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. Well said, Sudi. Thank you. Victoria was trying to get in earlier. Did you oh, want to... well, I, I just wanted to add on a little bit to what Carlton said that, um, of course, it is very unfortunate that uh, although we now have emerging knowledge of um, the questionable biological distinctions between so-called different races, the very people who perpetrate, who perpetrate these outrages are among the least likely to be aware of them. And I think that that's a very important point that Carlton made. And I think, you know, in addition to uh, the science of um, human similarities, which of course we can extend across the natural world and we can even observe that the majority of the cells in the human body actually consist uh, by the microbiome of um, non-human organisms. So we're actually more part of the natural world than our constructs, our linear and uh, uh, sort of delineated constructs allow us to uh, admit. I think another, another kind of problem is also the neuroscientific observations of the way that people pre-conceptually um, identify as other and denigrate people who are visually different from themselves. So this is, this is pre-cognitive and it can happen as well among people of ostensibly liberal views. It's not something that's directly under control of the will. And it's something that I think, you know, I'm not an expert in this field, but it's something that I, I think can only change um, when there's a kind of a tipping point and there's a, a, a broader cultural environment of, um, of non-prejudicial um, perception of others. But, but one of the problems here is that these, these perceptions are deeply neurologically ingrained in us. And we have to do what we can with our conscious minds to build a world where that's no longer true. But we have to recognize how deep these issues go. Thank you, Victoria. I, I agree they're very deep. And, uh, but I'm also, as you speak, I'm reminded when uh, Malcolm X went to the Hajj in Saudi Arabia, and he shared accommodation and food with uh, people that were brown and white in his, you know, in, by American standards. And I think it's very important to remember and to know that there's been other points in history and other civilizations where race, particularly as constructed in the United States of America historically and certainly today, was very different. And I think uh, there are societies in the world where race is constructed differently and the history is different. And I don't think it's something innate. That I think it's something that we learn and society yeah. uh, imposes on us in a sense. I think so. There, there are ways, I think, historically and in other parts of the world to get out of this sort of uh, prison of these uh, categories. Mm. In a Thank way. you. Uh, I hope. Yeah. So I teach, a course, I teach a course called Racing Through Genetics with a Molecular Biologist. We've been teaching for several years. It's an important course. 
I don't accept the idea of neurological wiring for difference. We are taught difference. And the two picture illustrations I showed a few minutes ago from Harper's Magazine, people who see it on their own today don't understand it. It seems foreign. It seems like, oh, this is just a caricature. No, these were racial caricatures. The 1924 closure of the American gates to immigration with the same demonizing language and propaganda. You can find it in Scott Fitzgerald's uh, the, the Great Gatsby. There's a reference to Stoddard and, and to, to the race thinkers. I mean, this was learned and then it was unlearned. It was unlearned the moment that housing was intentionally by the government channeling Euro-Americans who were seen as European races into suburbs where black people, whatever color they were, were excluded. And there you had the grandchildren who became white, who became generically white. I mean, we are responsible for what we teach. And if we don't teach it, it won't be out there. So no, difference is learned. Most young black Americans today, I mean, American Americans in the South, do not look at a person and look at the context to decide if they're black or not. But my generation and some of you on the panel are perfectly aware of who, of who um, Walter White was. And Walter White was a white looking man who was a black man, who identified as a colored man. And Plessy versus Ferguson, which introduced separate and equal, it's not separate but equal, it was separate and equal according to the Supreme Court. That was a test case with a white looking colored man again. So we've forgotten that. We're so obsessed with talking about color because we're so obsessed with refusing to deal with history. Yes, what happens today is important. Yes, if I'm a brown-skinned person walking outside or driving on the highway, I am afraid if I see a white police officer and I'm 68. Mm -hmm. My granddaughter does not look white, does not look brown. My daughter does not look brown. My oldest son does not look brown. But in their head, they know they're not white. Mm -hmm. So it's also a matter of what's inside of your head. And we have to remember that. We have to be reminded of that. And again, no, we can't teach the person at the gas station what that is. We have to do it in the classroom. But to Carlton's point, and back to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, it is forgotten. It is not talked about that they were both killed exactly at the moment when they put class inequality equal to racism, when they understood that class inequality brings racism, that racism feeds off of class inequality, when they both agreed that if you don't unite poor people, poor people, not black poor people, poor people, then poor people will continue to be exploited and poor people will continue to be at the bottom of the barrel. And that resentment that being ignored is a lot of what drives, not the white supremacists, because that's a whole other story, but it does drive a lot of the white resentment throughout the large majority of the country where poor people have suffered because they don't have access to good health care. We're in the nursing homes throughout Iowa, Dakotas, where have you. These are white people who are dying because there are a lot of white people, but they're not in CNN's radar, so we don't see them. So we talk about black people, but we don't talk about poor people. I think that yes, yes, and yes, yes, and Mike, Michael, uh, Michael Moore uh, jumps in there too and says, "Look, a lot of them it, it kind of re reifies itself too." He says because a lot of the, the poor whites are not well educated, and so where where are you going to work your way out of this? Because they don't give a flying hoot about capital groups or social construction of race, right, or any form of alterity, right, right. A, a, except that they feel it, right? They don't want to talk about it. Or study. That's why that expression, white trash, is about garbage, disposability. But there's a reality to those situations that they can actually change how they look, change their identity, change the way they talk, and be accepted on a level that we can never be accepted on. Um, I don't think that that's accurate. And I just, a quick anecdote. When I came back from Israel, I lived in Israel for 21 years. I came to do a PhD at Duke and then got recruited to Grinnell. I remember with my father, who's from, Jama who, he died, but he was from Jamaica, going to set up the electric bill in Durham, North Carolina. And we were not paying attention. We were talking with each other. And we weren't paying attention to an exchange at the payment center. 
And then we both look up and we look at each other and we say, wow, he talks like a black person. And I was reminded and I said to him, he talks like people at the public projects next door from the South. He was Southern. Poor white people, they get ignored. I am not, an, I don't want to defend them. I don't want to, you know, we can go a whole long way with that. But I do want a, re a reminder. If you are poor and if you are white today and in the past, you are ignored. And I will call your attention to a very important article written in 1930 by one of the black uh, scholars who attended Harvard, one of the few. I don't have his name in front of me and I don't know why I can't remember because I just taught him a couple of weeks ago. But the title of the article is Poor Whites and Negroes. And what he said was that after slavery, who had skills? Slaves had skills. Who were at the bottom? White people. What well, was the compromise America made? Screw black people. Well, I grew up in the projects and I grew up poor and I didn't know how to speak correctly. I attended Morehouse <laughs> College. I actually learned how to speak correctly at Morehouse College, which allowed me to elevate myself along with education. So I believe that one can learn how to speak and speak differently if they're exposed to it. And if that, if that person happens to be of a different skin hue, they would get advantages that I wouldn't receive because I can speak the King's English, I can have the highest education, but I'm always gonna be a black male. And I'm always gonna be subjected to the every ill that we are subjected to. And I can't say that for someone who's not black or someone who's white, who may have grown up the same way and learn how to speak mm -hmm. and assimilate it into their already given culture. How would I know? Does anybody else want to comment? It's powerful. So, my, so I'll, I'll say two things very quickly. We're going to end in about 10 minutes at the top of the hour. Um, there was a comment from uh, Gabriel Brom uh, to Katya. He was reminding you that uh, Ilan Omar is a congresswoman from Minnesota, not far from where you are, so it's in the Midwest. Um, yeah, so that was the only point. Does any, anybody else want to say something, add to that? To Ilan Omar? No, to the general conversation. I want to bring Gabby into the conversation. What we're seeing and what we're all speaking about is general that racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia are rooted in not only, but are propelled by certain forms of economic injustice. So, so really if, I, if, I, if I can touch on that, I mean, now I remember what I wanted to say. You were talking about poor white, uh, sort of marginalized white communities across the United States. But is this becoming, given socioeconomic marginalization uh, in the sort of neoliberal moment, uh, and now with COVID-19, with the economic catastrophe that we're beginning to experience, is that also uh, Donald Trump's base? Are they also being kind of hit on, given their frustrations and their difficult socioeconomic and political and cultural situation? Aren't these, are, isn't this sort of ripe for the rise of right-wing nationalism and xenophobia? Yes, but I think, again, it's true. I do make a distinction between how we need to approach things analytically and how we react to them emotionally. So my politics, Sometimes there's a divide between me in the classroom and me, and I tell students, you know, you don't want to know what I really think sometimes. But analytically, there's no question that, that, that white people are not the only people supporting Trump. Okay? So there is high South Asian Indian conservatism. They don't dislike Donald Trump or what he represents. Let's not put it on just Trump. Let's talk about his enablers and the principles. There are people who have conservative values across the Christian world and across the color line in the Christian world. They don't like Trump, but they don't necessarily not like the Republican Party. I don't, I don't, so I don't, it's too easy to say to I'm not trying to put it I'm not like trying to put it on Trump. You know, I'm not, I'm, not trying to, gotcha. I'm not trying to put it on Trump. What I'm saying is uh, you were talking about the commonalities of uh, of economic marginalization, political marginalization of poor people, white people and African-American people. And Latinos. But, 
but uh, yeah, but I'm I, it, given the changing political dynamic, and I'm not putting this on on Donald Trump. I'm looking I'm looking more at historical and structural uh, segregation. Is is given the the politics of our time? Are these populations going to be predisposed to kind of progressive coalitions and fighting oppression and fighting for social justice, or are we entering into a phase where it's dangerous and this? The socioeconomic condition is ripe for reactionary social movements. Well, I'll just come back. I'm wondering if somebody else could uh, join yeah, in. The let me just come back to one thing, and then the rest, Dr. Rome and Dr. Ali and Dr. Long, maybe can add to this. But if we go back to the period of the Black Panthers in the 1960s, it didn't succeed, but completely. But one of the main principles was different people have to work in their own communities, and then leaders can get together and bring about coalitions. So poor white people don't necessarily need me to advocate for them. And I don't need them to advocate for me. But we do have to do the hard, diligent, Saul Alinsky type of grassroots work. And the Tea Party proved that it's possible. Unfortunately, on the more progressive side, we don't really see that kind of campaigning. Well, you know, if I can add to that, Katya, that reminds me a bit of um, Stokely uh, Carmichael and Charles Hamilton in, in Black Power talking about, well, there is a period in which, you know, sorry, guys, we're going to have to close ranks, right? Like for our own liberation, we're not about other people. We're not about that dialogue. We have to fix our own house and then we can look outward. And um, so I'll just throw him out there uh, for, for them out there for us and even just to, to just um, um, have people also think for a moment even about Booker G. Washington and um, the economic, you know, so often there are people who supported Trump who, who are, are rather numb. They're kind of novocained up on the social issues. They don't really care. They're looking at the bottom line economically. Like I'll put up with, I don't care about what the United States looks like on the world state. I don't say, care about the buffoonery. I don't care about the World Health Organization or, or the laughing at the, in the G8 summits, all that. I don't care about that. I want to know, am I profitable? I want to know my financial bottom line. And if that's good, I'm good. There is that reality. And they're just numb to the social issue because it doesn't, in the, almost like the inverse of, you know, closing ranks. It doesn't affect them. And they say, I'm not a racist. I just, you know, I like my money. Yeah. Doc, I wanted to add to that too. Uh, President Lyndon B. Johnson, he once said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, <laughs> give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Mm -hmm. Right? So, Part, part of the challenge, uh, there's an excellent book by Nancy Eisenberg called White Trash, The 400-Year Untold History of Class in America. And I'm, I'm with Dr. Small. Unfortunately, when these groups are uneducated, they are conditioned to believe it's the other's fault for why they don't have. Uh, they become reactionary forces. So how do you have these critical conversations with them, like what Bobby Kennedy did toward you know, uh, his, when, when he was running for president uh, in, you know, 68, how do you, how do you have these critical conversations uh, that, that allow us to, to not judge each other, but educate each other? Thank you. Victoria, you wanted to come in? Uh, I think on this particular issue, I will cede the stage to people with deeper uh, scholarship than myself, but uh, thank you for inviting my comment. You're welcome. Anybody else would like to chime in? We have a few minutes left. But Victoria, you spoke to environmental racism, mm -hmm. environmental economic injustice, mm -hmm. and that is true across, across the country. The people who lived in Flint, Michigan were not only Black. So Flint, Michigan, anybody who lived there, and other parts of the country where we're discovering that the pollution is entering into bodies. We need to be focusing on that. I just, I, I, as I said in the beginning of my talk, there are certain tiring cliches that have reinforced themselves over the last 20 years and have taken us far away from the key issues. And I think that we, I mean, I speak now, we as a member of ISGAP, even when sometimes Charles and I don't agree, um, you know, but that we, that we have to be diligent about reminding each other what are our goals and what are the best strategic tactics 
to use for different audiences. So what I teach at Grinnell College, I would have to change it if I were to come to Fisk or if I were to go to Spelman. And the reverse is true as well. So I, in my classes where many of my students are white, I tend to put the focus on white people because I don't want them objectifying black people. And I always throw in things about Jews. And I never, I never let them walk away thinking that Jewish is okay, but Jews is not a good word. Or that the Jewish people began with the Holocaust. We're bigger than that. We're greater than that. And we did not start out in Europe. And you know, those are those little things that you don't have to have a whole class. You throw them in like seeds and eventually they stick. So that's one of the reasons I like Drake. Mm -hmm. From Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> great great yeah. i just read about drake you know so you know the story about drake but you know he's the, he's the most successful male musician in the history of music in terms of sales it's amazing wow ever yeah anyway so on that note so we have to end because it's near the top of the hour but there were a lot of questions there were 30 questions we only got to a few so i'm very sorry that we didn't get to so many so i want to thank the people who posed the questions and given that we didn't respond to many of the questions, I, I propose to you guys uh, live on Zoom that we, we reconvene and do this again, maybe in a few weeks, because I think these issues are pertinent. And I think with the lockdown and COVID-19 and the economic uh, catastrophe, which it's is hours. developing, that a lot of these issues are uh, gonna be with us for a while and it'd be nice to revisit them. That was great. It's an honor to have you guys with us again. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you very much for, for your wisdom and your inspiring comments. And I'm not saying this to be polite. I really mean it. It's amazing. And uh, stay safe and healthy. And uh, hopefully we can reconvene again. And I hope we can uh, develop some good work because I think there's a, there's a bit of a vacuum, an area of uh, issues that we're speaking to that is really not being addressed in the academy and by leaders of our communities. So true, true. And thank you, Charles. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Carlton, for organizing it. And thank you, Ira, in the background. Yeah, as wow. always in the background. Thanks, great. It's wonderful. So thank you, Suni, Kevin, Katya, Carlton, and Victoria. Thank you very much. Nice. Stay safe and be well. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.